following lecture is aimed for dental students, interns, junior trainees, junior residents of oral surgery and oral maxillofacial surgery, and junior residents of other dental specialties. It is also dedicated to the dental practitioners of all dental specialties all over the world. I hope you all benefit from it. In memory of my late parents, may Almighty Merciful God rest their souls in heaven and peace. Please allow me to give a brief bio about the speaker. My name is Mohammed El Shulkami. I'm a professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery at the Faculty of Dentistry, Suez Canal University in Ismailia, Egypt. This lovely city, which lies around 120 kilometers to the eastern of the capital Cairo in Egypt, it was named after the late uh, great ruler of Egypt, Khedivi Ismail, the one who did the opening ceremonies of the Suez Canal in 1869. I'm also the professor and the supervisor of the oral maxillofacial surgery department at Faculty of Dentistry, Sinai University, Kantara campus in Ismailia. I also worked as a part-time associate professor at MIU University and MSA University for several years. I'm a visiting professor at the Faculty of Dentistry, Beirut Arab University in the oral and maxillofacial surgery department in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm also the Managing Director of the Egyptian Dental Center, a multi-speciality discipline dental and maxillofacial center based in Cairo, Egypt. The main topic for today, I find it one of the most important topics in the dental practice, is the management of the medically compromised patients. Let's start with introduction to the management of medically compromised patients in the dental practice. What are our main headlines, intended learning outcomes, different systems disorders, and the ASA physical status classification system? Stress reduction protocol, gathering information and taking history and how to anticipate and prevent the development of such medical emergencies, and last but not the least, the importance of office staff training. So I hope that you will enjoy my show like we used to enjoy the legendary Michael Jordan games. So let's go to the intended learning outcomes. By finishing this group of lectures regarding the medically compromised patients, you should have a good knowledge of the different disorders related to different systems of the human body. You should be aware of the physical status classification as presented by the American Society of Anesthesiologists. You should understand the basic pathophysiology and predisposing factors of each medical disorder to be able to deal with it. You should have substantial knowledge of the different signs and symptoms related to each medical condition, and this should alert the clinician if any disorder is present. And let me tell you, some disorders are discovered in the dental clinic by the dentist. You should identify the different risk factors that might lead to potential complications during the dental treatment. Anticipation of different potential complications, hazards, and emergencies that might develop during the dental treatment. Be prepared with different emergency drugs and kits suitable to face any emergency situation on the dental chair. And you should manage your visit to pass safely without any potential complications that might rise from the medical condition. And if any medical emergency should happen or develop on the dental chair, you could be able to manage it and don't panic. And I will try always to keep it simple, but of course not on the Da Vinci's way. So, what are the medical conditions of concern? We have the cardiovascular system disorders, respiratory system disorders, the renal disorders, hepatic disease and disorders, endocrinal disorders, hematological disorders, neurological disorders, pregnancy and postpartum, although it is regarded as a physiological entity, not a pathological entity, and last but not the least, the radiotherapy and chemotherapy patients. Let's come to the cardiovascular system disorders. We are going to discuss angina pectoris, myocardial infarction, the coronary artery bypass graft, cabbage, and angioplasty, congestive heart failure, cardiac dysrhythmias, cerebrovascular accident, hypertension, and the endocarditis risk patients. On the respiratory system disorders, we are going to discuss two main topics, the bronchial asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the COPD. And of course, don't mix it with the Colorado Police Department, please.
In the renal system, we had two major, we have two major entities, the chronic renal insufficiency, the renal dialysis patient, and the renal transplant patients and patients who had other transplanted organs. When we discuss the hepatic disorders, we need to clarify the causes of such hepatic failure and hepatic disease, among or on the top of which is the viral hepatitis. Then in the warm countries like Egypt and India, we face bilharziasis, and last but not the least, the alcoholism. The endocrinal disorders, we have, of course, the mighty diabetes mellitus and disorders of the thyroid gland, hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism, and last but not the least, the adrenal insufficiency. When we come to the neurological disorders, we have two main entities, the seizure disorders, epilepsy, and the alcoholism. Under the hematological disorders, we have two main categories, hereditary coagulopathies, such as hemophilia, and therapeutic anticoagulation, the patients who are taking anticoagulants. Then we come to the pregnancy and postpartum patient. And last but not the least, the radiotherapy and chemotherapy. <laughs> the American Society of Anesthesiologists has formulated the physical status classification system based on the medical condition of the patient. And we use this system as a guideline to whether we need special precautions before the dental treatment, whether elective care is okay, whether only emergency care is uh, allowed. So it gives us an idea about uh, how far can we do some treatment modifications. Let's start with the healthy patient as class one, where no special precautions are needed. And patients with mild systemic disease of class two, like pregnancy and well-controlled type two diabetes mellitus, here the elective care is okay, but some uh, treatment modifications might be considered. Let's move to the uh, ASA3, patients with severe systemic disease that limits activity, but it is not incapacitating like stable angina pectoris, post-myocardial infarction six months after the attack, and post-cerebrovascular accident six months also after the attack. Here the active care is okay, but some serious uh, consideration of treatment modification and treatment plan modification should be taken into consideration. When we go to the class four, the patient with incapacitating systemic disease that is, is a constant threat to life, like unstable angina and post-myocardial infarction within the first six months, here, the elective care is contraindicated. We only give emergency care non-invasive using drugs or an uh, emergency care should be done in a controlled environment in the hospital. Let's move to the class number five, moribund patient, which is not expected to survive 24 hours without interventional operation, like the end-stage cancer and end-stage infectious disease. Here, we only give palliative care to the patient. Additional class have been added to this classification, which is the ASA6, where the patient is declared brain dead and his organs are being removed for donation purposes. So on the right hand side, you see a nice illustrative diagram of the physical capacity of the patient according to their ASA classes. Mm. And when we come to talk about the anxiety, some medical emergencies are commonly provoked by anxiety like angina pectoris, thyroid storm, myocardial infarction, the insulin shock, asthmatic bronchospasm, hyperventilation, acute adrenal insufficiency, epilepsy, and severe hypertension. And let's face it and be frank with ourselves. Is there any stressful situation is more than sitting on a dental chair and visiting a dentist? Let's be frank with ourselves. We ourselves as a dental practitioner, when we are going to sit as patients on the dental chair, it might bear some sort of stress on ourselves. So let's face it, visiting the dental uh, office itself is, 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 is a very stressful situation. So please put yourself in the shoes of the patient and feel like what he feels and try to make it as comfortable as possible, please. So let's learn and move to the stress reduction protocol. It is divided into three phases, the pre-operative phase and the operative phase during the dental visit and the post-operative phase. Let's start first with the pre-operative phase, pre-medication prior to the appointment. It's an option to give hypnotic 
the night before surgery to promote sound sleep and also it's an optional to give a sedative immediately before the appointment like uh, 2.5 milligram of uh, Dormicum, Midazolam or 10 milligram of uh, Diazepam Valium but if you choose this option please tell the patient that he should come escorted and someone to accompany him he should not drive his car by himself or take uh, the elevator or whatsoever schedule a morning appointment in the early morning and minimize the patient waiting time in the waiting area during the treatment we have a non-pharmacologic means to control anxiety and pharmacological means of course let's start with the non-pharmacologic frequent verbal reassurances during the therapy Tell him that this is a routine procedure, it had been done so many times, it's very simple and it's going to end in, a, in no time and you're going to have no problems after that. Distracting conversation, let your conversation be a little bit smart and distracting away from the subject you are talking about. No surprises, the clinician should warn the patient before doing anything that can cause anxiety and uh, it, of course anxiety differs from from one person to another one no unnecessary noise your equipment should have a, a low sound and you could you should put your compressors away from the practice room relaxing background music is very important to to keep the patient on a on a low profile regarding the anxiety put the surgical kit away from the patient's site it's either by putting the bracket table a higher on a level and let the patient in a supine and semi-supine position or bring your kit on a, a moving uh, table and put it behind the patient after seating him. The length of the appointment should be controlled. Lengthy appointments should be avoided. The pharmacologic means of anxiety control, adequate pain control during the treatment and here rises the everlasting dilemma about using vasoconstrictor versus non-containing vasoconstrictor anesthesia uh, of course i would recommend using the vasoconstrictor to have a good amount of, of pain control a profound anesthesia and to have a good duration of anesthesia uh, which allows you to finish what you have started without any pain feeling by the patient and we are going to refer to this later when we talk about the american heart association recommendations regarding the vasoconstrictor you can consider using the um, nitrous oxide conscious sedation and you can use the intravenous anxiolytics as we referred before. Now we move to the post-treatment phase and it's very important. The patient information on what to expect after the surgery, after the procedures. The expected sequence should be told to the patient clearly like uh, blood oozing, swelling, burning sensation, atrismus whatsoever because Telling the patient what to expect afterwards relieves most of the stress that he can feel if he feels anything abnormal when he goes home. The post-operative instructions should be told to the patient and I would recommend that you print them and you read them in front of the patient or, or, or the one accompanying him or the guardian if, if the patient is minor and uh, make sure that they understand the instructions before going home. Further reassurances of course. Good post-operative pain control, this might be achieved through longer-acting local anesthesia like Marcaine, you can give it in the office, or you should use the appropriate anti-inflammatory and painkillers like corticosteroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as prescribed. Inform the patient uh, whom to contact if anything goes wrong, and take the initiative and call the patient on the same day in the evening. If you are busy, let one of your assistants or the front office team do this and tell the patient how are you doing are you feeling okay is anything uh, go, did anything go wrong are you okay and if anything goes wrong or if the patient tells them i have uh, some sort of feeling that the sutures are loose anything you can tell him you are welcome to come for a follow-up of course be aware please what you do at the clinic and what you wear be aware of of, of your of, of your uh, protective uh, wear uh, you are wearing at the clinic any drops of blood on this should be changed because some patients are extremely sensitive about the appearance of the of their doctor and their dentist 
you should try to make uh, the patients sitting in a comfort zone. Please try to make his visit and try to make your office and your dental chair as a comfort zone for the patient. Try to make it as a, some sort of a, a spa treatment, like, like we see in this uh, sarcastic picture. So we come to the gathering information point. How to anticipate and prevent the medical conditions? How to know that this patient is fit for your job and the other one is not? There is no way except systematic history. You should take a good and thorough systematic history and I'd recommend that you have uh, this at a printed questionnaire in a printed form in order not to omit or forget any uh, topic. A survey was done in Belgium in 2013, 550 dental practitioners were included and they were given uh, questions on the frequency and knowledge of the medical emergency situations in the dental office, the history of the dental training uh, to train such medical conditions. Remarkable results, 55.3 of the dentists took only medical history of the patient. And they found a link between the years since graduation and the systematic decline of medical history gathering in a new patient. The older the dentist, the less consistent was the updating of the medical history. And almost 50% of the dentists never participated in any BLS or basic life support training. So let's go to the point of the history. In order not to, you are, you are getting old, you might be busy, you, you have uh, many stuff to do and go around uh, to and fro. So, in order not to miss any point in the, in the medical history of the patient, and we sometimes we all do, you should have a printed question. Here is the medical questionnaire in a printed form. You should follow it and following the systems to, to ask about and the allergies and the drugs are being taken regularly and whatsoever. So, in order not to miss that and in order to relieve the burden off your shoulder, you can train the front office team to understand this questionnaire and help the patient filling it out in the, in, in the waiting area. Then the patient should sign. If the patient is minor, the guardian or the parents are going to sign. And I would recommend that you let one of your team or your nurse sign also at the witness. And then when the patient comes in your office, you should revise the medical questionnaire and, and look for any medical problems that he has and discuss it with him in order to clarify whether you are going to need some sort of modification of the drugs you give or, or the treatment procedures or the treatment plan, you need to modify to suit the medical condition of the patient. Furthermore, you might like to have this small card regarding updating the medical history of the patient. If the patient comes uh, for a visit after a few months or a few years, you might like to update the medical history of the patient by giving him this card and let one of the, your, your front office team uh, fill it out with him. We should always remember that we are treating patients presenting with problematic teeth. We are not treating teeth in patients that we don't care about their existing relevant conditions. If we would like to deal with only teeth, we should go to lab models and go to virtual planning using softwares. And as Murphy's Law states, if things can go wrong, they will. Or sometimes things are going to get wrong. So you must be prepared for that. Some people regard Murphy's Law as a pessimistic one, but I myself would like to regard it as uh, you, you should be prepared to whatsoever. So what if this law comes true? It can happen and it does come true. An incident was published in the LA Times in 1998. Patient has heart attack and dies, dentist also stricken. A 19-year-old Los Angeles man suffered a heart attack while he was having his wisdom teeth removed after induction of the general anesthesia. And surprising dentist as well, Dr. Jim Derek also suffered a heart attack. He couldn't stand, he couldn't withstand the situation of having his 19-year-old patient going in heart attack. So this points to the importance of having all the staff to be well trained to face such situations, not only the operating dentist, because if you are well trained, you might fall down and need someone else, else to take care of your life. So please, the whole staff should be trained. I'm going to add to the Belgian paper once more. 
where they surveyed about 550 dental practitioners in Belgium. It has been found that almost 50% of the dentists surveyed never participated in any basic life support training during their undergraduate education, and 78.3 of them had never had any pediatric basic life support as well. The postgraduate education was lacking by 37.2 of the dentists, and it has been concluded that the knowledge of the basic life support should be fundamental to all medical professionals and dental professionals. And I myself would add that the whole staff in the dental office should be trained to avoid such an incident that happened in, in Los Angeles in 1988. The more basic life support training the practitioner has experience about, the more self-secure they feel and the more confident they feel coping with emergency situations. So please, let's emphasize it once more. Train yourself and train your assistants and train you, the whole staff and the front office team and you should buy them in and you should buy their eagerness and enthusiasm and their loyalty for such training. The staff training, as we said before, we should buy in all the staff enthusiasm and eagerness and loyalty and dedication to be part of this process. All the personnel should be trained to assist and recognize and manage the medical emergencies. You should always have regular emergency drills in your office. All the staff should have their annual uh, BLS skills renewed every year. Also, you should put a pre-assigned specific responsibilities for each one of them so that when a medical emergency occurs, each one knows exactly what task he should perform. And here is a simple outline of the emergency facing protocol. You should terminate all the dental procedures taking place. Proper positioning of the patient according to the pre-existing medical condition. Definitive management using drugs or otherwise according to the pre-existing medical condition. Assessment of the consciousness of the patient and on any deterioration or change in the consciousness state, we should activate the BLS protocol. Last but not the least, we should call for help and this is done according to the each country protocol. And back once more to our slogan, I would like to emphasize that this group of lectures are aimed to let you expect and manage any medical emergency on the dental office. And the main aim of such lectures is to let you carry out a safe dental visit and dental procedures on an outpatient basis in your clinic. And should any complications happen or develop, you should be able to identify and deal with without any panic. And this should be done on a team basis approach rather than individual approach. And you should always be careful when to operate and when not to operate for such patients according to their medical condition. The references of such lectures, we have the Contemporary Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery by James Hupp, Ed Ellis, and Myron Tucker, and the other book is The Medical Emergencies of the Dental Office by Stanley F. Malamed. The chapters of concern in the Contemporary Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, the sixth edition, are Preoperative Health Status Evaluation and Prevention and Management of Medical Emergencies. And there's another review regarding the management of the hypertensive dental patient, and I can supply to you upon request. And finally, I would like to thank you for your kind attention.